Did we find signs of life on another planet? Not so fast, mister. It would be exciting, jaw-dropping, earth-shattering to find signs of life on another planet. And recent stories and YouTube videos have suggested that the amazing James Webb Space Telescope may have allowed researchers to discover signs of life on an exoplanet 124 light years away from the Earth, K218b. However, many exoplanet scientists are skeptical. The search for life is an incredibly exciting endeavor, which is ultimately what made me want to become an exoplanet astronomer myself. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, like the, these initial findings that are being reported at the moment in terms of an atmospheric detection of a planet in the habitable zone, th this is ultimately what gets me up every day wanting to research planets around other stars. But in terms of the uh, claims of a possible detection of a molecule associated with life, uh, it's, it's far too premature at this particular stage. And I think there needs to be a higher bar when it comes to claims of life in the universe. In this video, I will explain why. K218b has fascinated astronomers looking for biosignatures of life for several years. K218b orbits a red dwarf and sits in its habitable zone. That means it receives about the same amount of starlight as the Earth receives from the Sun, conditions that should allow for the existence of liquid water. Previous measurements using the K2, Spitzer and Hubble Space Telescopes in 2019 also identified the presence of water in the atmosphere of K218b. Now, new findings from JWST, released in a preprint just last week, seem to back up the idea that the exoplanet could be a haven for life. The authors claim that spectra of K218b's atmosphere indicate the presence of molecules linked to life here on Earth, potential biosignatures. They point to the presence of carbon dioxide, methane, and especially dimethyl sulfide, or DMS. On Earth, the production of dimethyl sulfide is only associated with life. And the bulk of DMS in the Earth's atmosphere is produced by phytoplankton living in marine environments. The authors also claim that K218b may host a water ocean, given models of the planet's composition and physics and the specific molecules that we see in the spectra of its atmosphere. So the phytoplankton could be living in this ocean. So surely this is a slam dunk. Water oceans, planet in the habitable zone, organic molecules in the atmosphere. K218b seems to tick all of the boxes for being a host for life. It's a celebration. You ring back home. You ring your wife. Baby, we done it. We're rich, baby. Break out the red panties. So why are exoplanet scientists advising extreme caution when claiming that the recent findings point to signs of life on K218b? Well, firstly, the statistical evidence for the presence of dimethyl sulfide in the atmosphere is extremely weak. There are no significant bumps in the spectra at the absorption frequencies of dimethyl sulfide, as we see for other molecules. The spectrum in the dimethyl sulfide regions is pretty flat. Experts have estimated that the statistical support for dimethyl sulfide in the atmosphere is at about the one sigma level. That means that there's roughly a 35% chance that any presumed dimethyl sulfide bump in the data is just noise. This is far below the scientific standard required to claim a detection. The statistical analysis, <laughs> it's so beautiful. What's more, even if dimethyl sulfide is present in the atmosphere of this exoplanet, it's hard to know whether processes on a faraway exoplanet could have produced the compound naturally. K218b is nearly 2.6 times as large and nine times as massive as the Earth. These sub-Neptune type exoplanets are the most common that we know of in our galaxy, but they don't exist in our solar system. As such, their compositions, dynamics, and atmospheres are poorly understood. It's hard to rule out a natural production mechanism for dimethyl sulfide in an environment which is not very well constrained. In this way, the potential discovery of dimethyl sulfide is quite like the contested claimed discovery of phosphine in the clouds of Venus in 2020. Do you remember? In addition, the new analysis claims detection of carbon dioxide and methane, but not water. This contradicts the results from 2019. Why is this? Well, exoplanet scientists note that the latest JWST analysis 
only presents a single JWST data reduction from a single team. JWST is a very new cosmic observatory, and scientists are still formulating best practice regarding how raw data from the telescope should be cleaned, analyzed, and presented. Different analysis frameworks and pipelines can impact the shape of spectral features derived from raw JWST data. These different shapes can then change the identities of the molecules you think you've detected and their relative abundances. The relative abundances especially are very sensitive to the analysis pipeline used. So we need to see multiple teams with multiple analysis pipelines with higher statistics, all pointing to observations of carbon dioxide, methane, and especially dimethyl sulfide, before we can even be confident that these biosignatures are present in the atmosphere of K218b. I want a second opinion. I don't trust these creatures to... I mean, how old are you? I'm 20. Nine. That's a lie. How old are you? Words. You look dead. The claim of a water ocean on K218b is also highly contentious. The claim largely rests on K218b having about 1% methane in its atmosphere. That's minus two on the plots here. However, as we mentioned, the amount of each molecule in the atmosphere is very sensitive on the analysis pipeline used. We have no independent analysis, so it's hard to quantify the errors and uncertainties on this observation and this claim. Indeed, the same authors now claiming that K218b might have a water ocean have previously shown that chemical abundances derived from raw JWST data can vary by an order of magnitude when they change the data pipeline. Yes, yeah, so, so, so what we're seeing here, this is an example from a, a hot Jupiter called WASP-96b in a paper published by uh, Michael Radica earlier this year. And what this is showing is that uh, we don't just, um, when we get the telescope observations, it doesn't just magically give us that spectrum of like the fraction water of starlight found, carbon dioxide found, <laughs> if, yeah. if only it was, if only it was that, that easy, like the actual, the actual raw data, it's, it's a bit messy. You get like a spectral trace of like light, like spread over a detector. It looks a bit like a banana with one of the instruments. <laughs> there are cosmic ray hits. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff you have to do to clean up and process the raw data to get it in the form that we can even start doing uh, atmospheric modeling. And that requires decisions by humans to to mm -hmm. consider ways that you're going to do that, which has potentially an impact on the data. So we see the the data modulated by these decisions that are made about that analysis pipeline. It, exactly. And because these, these are pretty new instruments, we've only been getting science data for about a year or so now. Um, we're still figuring out the yeah. best practices for how to actually do this. And so uh, the way that we tackled this problem with the very first announcements of JWST exoplanet atmosphere results, um, the detection of carbon dioxide in the hot Jupiter was 39b, is that uh, we got basically all of the exoplanet astronomers or most of us around the world together onto one giant team. I know it will sound tiny compared to particle physics. We only have 300 <laughs> people, but that that's huge. Like for, that's, for that's this... like a one paper for like 300 <laughs> people. But yes, go ahead. So yeah, we got 300 exoplanet astronomers together and we threw everything we had at it. Everyone used their own pipelines. So we had, had more than like five data reduction pipelines or we had multiple theories with different codes and techniques. And then everyone was seeing this carbon dioxide detection that was like right. more than 20 sigma in that case. And so, and that's what we're seeing illustrated here, that if you look, for example, at uh, kind of the blue points and like the, the orange points, they look by eye to be quite different. There's still like a bump at 1.4 on that plot. That's water in the atmosphere of this hot giant planet, for example. So these two codes would agree that there is water in the atmosphere. And yeah, and again, on the bottom panel as well. But the spread is is much larger. Yeah. The shape is slightly different. So these would then disagree on how much water there is in the atmosphere. Mm. So so this just illustrates that, and especially if you if you're trying to like claim an ocean on a planet based on an <laughs> argument of how much of each molecule there is, yeah. even if the detection is is robust, you can easily move about the abundances. So so essentially for most papers that have come out in the last year with JWST data. We've tried to have multiple different yeah. people with different pipelines reducing the observations, show that they're consistent, and ideally have multiple theorists interpreting it as well. Yes. Um, and so that has become pretty much like a gold standard methodology that most exoplanet results have been using yeah. in order for us to be convinced that it's real, 
or at least be able to quantify the spread of possible answers. Yes. Like marginalizing over kind of all the choices that humans can make. So you so you uh, could take all of these, you know, this one says 5%, this one says 10%, this one says 7.5%. Mm-hmm. So it's probably 7.5% plus or minus 2.5%. Or what, you know, just, yeah, exactly. just picking numbers out of my head. And and so this was one of the main reasons why I was we were initially quite skeptical about the K218B ocean claim because there was only one one pipeline that was actually used, and then one set of models. That's not to, not to say that it's it's wrong, of course. And I, I look forward to um, you know other groups being able to independently analyze the raw data and then check these. We need to see more independent analyses and higher statistics before we can make the claim that K218B has a water ocean. This is what you want. So, let's get it. Enough talk. Oh. Now, everyone obviously wants these claims to be true. It would be absolutely amazing to find solid evidence that life is flourishing elsewhere in our galaxy. However, at the moment, Claims that we have potential biosignatures of life and water oceans on a far off exoplanet are ahead of the evidence. Given the low statistical support for these claims, some exoplanet scientists have even questioned whether claims of signs of life should have been made in scientific press releases and in media pieces. It's all right, like, overrated as f- in my opinion. I mean, so how do we get clarity and where do we go from here? Well, the data that has been analyzed in the recent studies is embargoed for one year post-observation. That means that the raw data will not be publicly and fully available to the wider scientific community until June 2024. However, the data could be released early by the authors of the current analysis to allow independent verifications of their results by multiple teams using multiple analysis frameworks. Let's hope this occurs. JWST is also planning to reobserve K218B four times with the same instruments from January to May 2024, producing higher statistics and a much more precise and robust spectrum. These statistics will help us to nail down the exact molecules present in the atmosphere and their relative abundances. This will then help us to be more confident in the identification of any biosignatures and even the presence of a water ocean. JWST will also observe the planet in longer wavelengths of infrared light using the MIRI LRS instrument in April 2024. These wavelengths should allow a search for an alternative dimethyl sulfide bump at higher wavelengths and help us to determine whether DMS really is present in the atmosphere of K218b. There also needs to be far more study into the chemistry and potential production mechanisms of dimethyl sulfide. That will allow us to rule out any natural production mechanisms here on Earth and potentially on far-off exoplanets. As we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. The recent findings are clearly extremely exciting and we desperately hope that they lead to the discovery of life on another planet in our galaxy. However, there's a hell of a lot of work still to be done. And as scientists, we need to keep the evidence bar high when asking one of the most far-reaching and groundbreaking questions in the history of our species. Are we alone in the universe? I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment if you wish to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.